we are very happy to have uh, John Schneider from uh, Princeton today. John is a PhD student in the Computer Science Department at Princeton, working with Mark Bremerman. Uh, he has worked on information complexity and uh, online learning with uh, some strategic element to it. And today he's going to talk about the latter topic. Hi. Yeah, so, so I'm going to talk about some work we did on multi armed bands with strategic arms. And this is joint work with my advisor, Mark Braverman, and Jimmy Mao and Matthew White. So the general sort of subject of this talk is about learning in strategic contexts. So very generally, learning algorithms assume inputs are drawn stochastically or adversarially. But increasingly, inputs are controlled by strategic agents in a bunch of contexts. And uh, talk about this more later, but algorithms with good adversarial guarantees don't necessarily perform well in the strategic case. And you might think, how is this possible? Adversarial encompasses everything, and I guess that'll be the focus of this talk. So the specific learning problem we'll look at is the multi arm banded problem. So classically, you have k choices, which are arms, and each round over the course of t rounds, you choose one arm to pull. Uh, and this will give you generally either a stochastically or adversarially generated reward. And your goal is to maximize your total reward. All right. And this sort of model is a trade off between exploration and exploitation. Because uh, you need to spend some time figuring out what the best arm is. But once you have figured out what the best arm is, you want to pull it as much as possible to maximize your total reward. And the way these algorithms are usually phrased is in terms of regret. So it's just a notation. So arm i gives you a reward vit if you pull it around to t. And we'll say that if the algorithm m pulls arm it around t, or it is a random variable, then the regret of m is just the difference between uh, its total value, the sum of vit comma t, and the maximum of all arms, the value you would have gotten if you just pulled that arm. All right, and yeah, it's exactly how much worse you do than the best arm there currently is. All right, and it's well known that, all right, so we'll say an algorithm is delta low regret if with high probability the regret of the algorithm is the most delta. So we're not taking expectations as usual. So we're not, uh, uh, we'll, we'll do the strong version. We'll just do with high probability. Okay. Yeah, but uh, some of these things you only need expectation to be mm -hmm. regret. We'll back to that later. But yeah, for simplicity, let's just uh, look at algorithms which are uh, low regret in the adversarial case with high probability. Mm -hmm. So like the strongest uh, banded algorithms in this sort of finite setting. So yeah, so there's many known algorithms, even in this case, that achieve uh, approximately square root KT regret. And so for example, in the stochastic setting, UCB achieves approximately root KT regret. And in the adversarial setting, EXP3 achieves root KT regret. And you can make it achieve, you can make both these achieve it with high probability. All right, so what do strategic arms mean? So the strategic multi arm banded can mean many things. For us, we're looking at the case where each arm is an individual rational agent. And uh, before, when you pulled an arm, you just would receive some value. Now, when you pull an arm, uh, the arm receives some value. Let's say it's stochastically generated. Uh, and it chooses what amount of that value to pass on to the, to the arm puller, what we'll call the principal. All right, so after this round, the principal receives utility x, and the arm receives utility v minus x. And notably, the principal doesn't learn exactly how much value the, the arm got. So the arm receives some value and passed on x, Principal learns x, but doesn't learn exactly how much the arm could have given it. It's value v. And there's sort of this inherent trade off here in between the arm keeping most of the value, in which case it'll get more value, but it'll get pulled less, and passing on most of the value, in which case it'll get played more often, but it doesn't get as much value. 
All right, so this sort of thing is, uh, so in addition to being like a generalization of multi-arm bands in the skewtuk setting, it, it captures a lot of aspects of uh, the principal agent problem with many agents. So for example, you can, there's models where this can model uh, hiring one of K investors to manage some amount of money or hiring one of K contractors to perform some work and you know, like choosing between one of K sellers that can offer varying discounts or prices. All right. Um, all right, so one natural question maybe after seeing this model is why can't we just run exp3 or ucb or something? Uh, like, you know, it seems like that'll still incentivize the arms to compete maybe because, you know, if one arm doesn't give so much, it'll get overtaken by the other arms. Seems naturally to do well. Um, so, it, or, or you might just say, okay, the strategic setting is a subcase of the adversarial setting. So if it does well in the adversarial setting, it should do well in the strategic setting. So that's true, and like in the case that we still have low regret, but low regret just means we do as well as the best arm. And it's possible that you know, after all these arms are strategic and agree on some equilibrium or converge on some equilibrium, even the best arm might give us very little if we run something like exp3. Okay. And there's sort of the issue here between regret and policy regret. So like uh, these arms, these algorithms will still have low regret, but this regret is with respect to you've run the algorithm and now you've fixed history and you look at, all right, if history stayed exactly the same, could I have done better by picking one arm? Instead of what if I went back and actually picked a different arm? That would change things. All right. Um, so we'll answer in a second whether exp3 does well. But uh, there's one last part of the model which is important, which we should establish, which is what do the arms know? So there are sort of two observational settings that the arms can uh, belong in. One is the arm sees, each arm sees all the other values reported by all the other arms. So you can see exactly what's going on in the game. And the other case, uh, the arms only see which arm is chosen every round. So you as an arm only see that arm J was chosen, but you don't see how much arm J gave to the principal. And in neither of these cases do the arms learn the other individual values. These are private. All right, so... Uh, so sorry, can you come back to the equilibrium notion? What's the equilibrium model you're using? Yeah, okay, so that's a good question. So, um, I may as well bring it to this slide. So, if we in there, don't worry. Yeah, so wait. the sure. equilibrium notion we'll be using is, so we assume that the arms have values drawn from some stochastic distribution, so equilibrium makes sense. And the equilibrium notion we're using is uh, like an epsilon approximate Nash equilibrium for the arms. So, basically, in the explicit model, in the in, well, we'll, we'll talk about both. But I think the important, the interesting model will turn out to be the tacit model. And these more like information sets in the tacit model. Yeah, you're gonna find the game formula. Yeah, but it, but it does a game or it does game? Like, what's the? Uh, is it, is it just game for game? Them. Yeah, just a just like a it's a repeated game. So just view it as like a strict Nash, not so not so game perfect. Just so you can include yeah, threats, you include all the other stuff. Yeah, it was all possible I can threat you to stop. So you're producing. looking at a repeated game, an equilibrium of the repeated game, or not? Uh, that was uh, not. Yeah, the equilibrium of the repeated game, the like actual of the entire T-Rap. The strategy is not just any program. policy, yeah. including like crazy policy that if you say pi or say greater than you can say pi minus epsilon. Yeah. Like threats are allowed. Yeah, threats are allowed. So threats are allowed. And threats are very powerful in the explicit model, which is why it's less interesting. Mm -hmm. In the tacit model, the arms can't communicate between themselves as directly. So it's a lot more subtle looking at it. And there, that's where you'll rely on the fact that you're actually using a lower grid algorithm. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else have any questions about the model right now? We have quite a bit of time. So how is the <coughs> regret measured again in this setting? Uh, so, the only notion of regret we'll use is 
we'll be talking about algorithms which have low regret and like the classic adversarial band of setting. So we actually won't talk about like regret special for we won't, we won't define a special notion of policy regret for this contract set. So but it's still um, defined as well, I mean, what, what is the algorithms payoff in this case? It's yeah, so what it is passed on. I think perhaps let's let's should explain the main theorem, which will explain sort of what uh, why we don't need to find the red instructor. So, so the main sort of result we have is that these two goals of being like of being an ordinary lower grade algorithm in the adversarial case and having uh, and being a good algorithm in the strategic case in the sense of the principal getting non-trivial revenue, these objectives are fundamentally at odds. Any lower grade algorithm there's some equilibrium for the arms where the principal receives little O of T revenue. Is but, that because, I'm sorry. Though, but this could be unrealistic because you're not doing sub game perfect. Yes, yeah, so I think, I think for the task case it should work even if you're doing sub game perfect. We'll see what happens. Yeah. Yeah, well, let's number to think that when we get to later in the proof. So this little of t Nash means that's the epsilon, right? That's the epsilon Nash. Yeah, it's an epsilon Nash, okay. thing, because like uh, you expect to get some constant amount per round from the arms. So you should get theta of t at the end. So little of t means you get something like t to the three quarters or something, or t to root t. So this was for both stats. No, it's not for the test and models. Uh, explicit so models. explicit model is even easier. So, so it's for explicit model you can actually do way better. You can give it zero revenue to the to the seller. And how much like that order of t Nash versus Nash matters in the theorem? Like instead of epsilon Nash, you just Nash. Which is, um, so I guess it's, find Nash it Nash might be, is. yeah, it might be important, but it's very hard to work with the exact Nash. So the point is that these like little OTs are, it's there's still little OTs, so it's, mm -hmm. okay. yeah. 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 Yeah, we don't know exactly whether you can, sorry, rule out Nash equilibrium. Okay. So in the passive theorem, what about the best equilibrium in terms of revenue? Yeah, so that's a good question. So what about, like, what can you say about the best equilibrium? Like, is there a lower red algorithm where, you know, in the best equilibrium, they, uh, the principal makes some amount of money? And the answer is, yeah, there's, are, there's good equilibria, but they're kind of weird. So basically, this sort of result is a collusion result. We'll show that the arms can effectively collude, even though they can't communicate amongst each other. They can still collude to give the principal nothing. It turns out that you know there is an equilibrium where they can also collude and give the principal a lot, or not not a lot, but like non-trivial. So they'll, right now they'll collude at giving them giving the principal like epsilon per round. But they can also give the principal like 0.1 plus epsilon per round. They can collude near mm -hmm. that level too. Yeah. So somehow the existence of a good equilibrium isn't as great as you want. You'd probably want something like you'd want something where being truthful is a dominant strategy or epsilon dominant. All right, any more questions? Okay, so basically the main theorem to summarize again is that like, property being lower grade in the adversarial case and the property of doing well in the strategic case are sort of fundamentally odds. So there's like some natural equilibrium for the arms where uh, the arms can pass along very little or zero revenue to the principal. And so it's phrased in the sense that there's some instance of this bandit problem, but actually it's true for like a very wide family of natural instances. We think it's probably true for every instance. You wonder like if you take t to infinity or consider sort of the geometric horizon setting. Yeah. 
or something like a folk theorem hold here like any 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 revenue is possible for the principal from zero to t yeah so you can sort of think of this as sort of like a, a folk theorem maybe for sort of like strategic benefits but uh yeah it's not we're not exactly sure what happens so like do you show like a like, set of possibility it seems like everything is possible no? if you take t to infinity and so generally what happens in, in probably like uh, <clears throat> i feel like you can probably construct um yeah some equilibrium that will give the principal any revenue but there's there's also some catches like we can't prove it for every single instance yet so i'll mention that later but for for most like settings of distributions and most um, possible revenues you want the principal to have. There is some sort of like equilibrium in this game where the principal will get that amount of average revenue per turn. So, so in this equilibrium, you actually have a non-trivial amount of revenue for for the arms. Yeah. So the arms also all get yeah. So because yeah, kind so of silly if it's little of t and the arms also get zero. So the, yeah. So that's. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, especially in this, yeah, the arms will get. Uh, I'll spoil this a bit. So the arms will roughly get played once every. If there's k arms will get played once every k turns, and basically, and they get to keep their entire revenue that turn. So on average, if their mean is u i, they'll make u i over k. Or um, t. Yeah. Per, yeah. Uh, times t. You mean yeah, mui over k times t. What is mui in this instance? So mui can be basically it. So um, it says there exists an instance, but as long as the gap between the largest two mui is not too big, then it works. You don't need you don't need all the mui's to be small or something. Yeah, I was so, wondering about that. Yeah, so you can cheat in a bunch of ways, like, but yeah. Okay, all of them would be like half, and then all the mui's can be half. In fact, if they're all equal, then then this theorem holds. So arms getting played one out of k times is basically you have like k sellers and all of them are thieves basically and like not them rob you and then therefore you don't care about which one to go to that sort of the equilibrium in this right yeah except somehow you know you need to make sure that Which your strategy doesn't you know if, if, yeah, <laughs> it has no incentives. Yeah. So oh, another question is like, uh, um, is information sharing between the arms? So, do they know each other's mu's to begin with? Um, like I can imagine. Sure. Like, suppose all of the arms knew that the mu is equal to half. Let's say, and then all the arms decide that okay, we're going to pass zero revenue to the principal, no matter what arm he picks, and we just want to share whatever revenue we make at the end of the day. Yes, yeah, so I, I think. So then why wouldn't that? Like why why would anybody want to deviate from this strategy? All right, so so what so strategy is all the arms have mu equals one half. Sorry. And so you, so your strategy is all the arms have mean one half. Let's say. Yeah. So and then so the equilibrium is they all uh, play zero. Yeah. And then they'll get played like equally often. They each get like half t. All right, but then you need to make sure it's not in any arms incentive to pay a little bit more, because if one arm starts playing, you know, like one third or like one. One tenth t per like one tenth per round. Okay. It'll suddenly by the lower get played like all the time. But then, uh, but then there's yeah. a threat to prevent that. But the point is that they're going to just share. So in the explicit the model, yeah, you can yeah. see that it's doing that. So explicit model is easy. okay. That's why it is, yeah. But the tacit model, you can't see that. Tacit model, all you see is that tacit one. This arm is maybe getting played more, and that's sort of what's going to happen. But, and you're not assuming that the lower grade algorithm is symmetric. Yeah, the lower good algorithm could also, you know, try to break this sort of strategy by being like, all right, I'm going to pick arm one for a while now. And you know, make them pretend like, you know, make them suspect arm one. The fact, you know, that's very good for the lower good algorithm. But we'll show that if our algorithm is actually low regret, it can't do this. There's some, well, and if, and if the arms are playing in the correct. Um, yeah, so I guess I mentioned some of this stuff, but so explicit case is easy. Explicit case is just this like sort of threat model. And it's very similar to things you'd see in repeated second price auctions. Basically, if the 
you know, all the arms watch each other. And whenever the arm reports something bigger than zero, they all simultaneously start giving all of their value. And, you know, or, you know, they could raise it a bit, but eventually, you know, there, there's a several threatening strategies where uh, you can disincentivize any arm from ever giving like a monster stretch. You can threaten them. Yeah, so that could be like yeah. a request, like said, so game completely get away, get rid of that. Hmm? So game perfect completely gets rid of that type of thing. Yeah, so sub game perfect, the explicit thing doesn't work. But I think the tacit thing will still work in the sub game perfect case. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the explicit thing also might violate this thing that was also mentioned about, uh, you know, maybe in this explicit equilibrium, one arm gets picked more than the others. Or whatever. Mm -hmm. So maybe one arm actually gets below a few revenue total. Because like there's no guarantee here that the market will get shared evenly between the two arms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so the explicit example is not great, but just to show that you can do very easy bad things in the explicit example if you don't care about being mm -hmm. subgame perfect or things like this. But the tacit example sort of subsumes all these things. So the tacit example um, is harder because you can't directly measure when the other arms are defecting. So instead, what they'll do is uh, the idea is that each arm tries to maintain an equal fraction of the market share. And the way it does this is sort of, uh, it sees how much it's getting played, and if it's getting played less than it should, it'll give like a tiny epsilon to the principal to encourage it to play it. And we can use this along with the fact that the principal is playing a lower risk strategy to show that uh, they can actually maintain this equal market share while passing along the very little to the principal. All right. Uh, yeah, so interesting. So is there a threat to if an arm gets excessive market share, punish it? Is that part of this? That is part of it, yeah. OK. Um, so I'm guessing maybe that violates something perfect, but. Yeah. It's not clear, because you can still make some amount of money, but if you're like the arm with the higher value. And but yeah, maybe it violates some good perfect. OK, so I guess one question is maybe like maybe the lower red provision there is unnecessary. Maybe you know any algorithm for the principle, uh, you know, there's some way for the arms to collude. They can't do better. And that's true for the explicit case. You don't worry about something being perfect. But for the tacit case, um, you can do better than lower red, and you can give the principal a constant amount per turn. And the algorithm is very simple. It's basically you end up running a second price auction. Talk about this later, but basically, if you uh, sort the means, then the principal can make the second largest mean per turn, roughly. And this algorithm is very much not lower red, and it can do better than lower red in the Tacit case. And yeah, it's a, it's a simple adaptation of the second price auction. I'll get more into detail of how exactly. No, can we describe it? Oh, sorry, you're describing yeah. the other um, Oh, this is just an, another addition to the. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not describing the, the second price auction algorithm right now. But, uh, so it's also possible to modify the second price auction algorithm to work with a combination of strategic and non-strategic cards. Also, more details on this later. All right, so I think the next big chunk of time, I'll try to walk through the interesting parts of the proof of theorem one, basically the uh, impossible result for the tacit case. So that it's impossible for any lower get algorithm to do well in the strategic setting. So uh, for simplicity, we'll, work, like, we'll walk through it for the case where there's only two arms, but there's a very similar proof for the case of k arms. It's a bit more complicated, but uh, sort of captures all the interesting parts. So um, yeah, let's, let's even do a very simple case. So we have two arms with fixed values. So arm one always gets q1 per round, and arm two always gets q2 per round. And let's also assume that 
the gap between Q1 and Q2 is at most a larger one over two. This is sort of the restriction on instances we have. And let's also assume that mechanism M we're using is delta lower grit, the adversarial worst case. Um, and we want to show that these two facts together imply that in the strategic setting, there's some square root T delta equilibrium where the principal gets the most uh, square root T delta revenue. All right, so I guess natural question, which I sort of answered is how can the arms collude without communicating? And the idea is if you're being played less than half the time, in this case, give a tiny amount, otherwise give zero. So, uh, just to find some notation, let's let C1T be the number of times arm one is pulled up to time T. And let's define C2T similarly. And we'll define these constants, B and theta. So B is like six root T delta, it's a number much bigger than one, and theta is root delta over T, so it's a number much smaller than one. It's our epsilon, basically. So this is the equilibrium strategy for the arms. So first of all, if ever you're played less than B times less than the other arm, uh, you should defect, basically just give out your full value from now on. Uh, otherwise, so this is an interesting thing because this is where the, so this equilibrium strategy is actually mechanism dependent. It depends on the mechanism M. The buyers, the arm sort of needs to know the mechanism M. Um, but anyways, otherwise, let P1T be the probability that the principal will pick you, pick arm one, and this round conditioned on the history so far. All right, so now there's two cases. If C1, like if the amount of times arm one is played is less than the amount of times arm two is played, and the probability arm one is going to get played in the next round is at most one half, uh, arm one pays epsilon or theta, a small amount. And otherwise, if this isn't true, uh, you need to set or arm one pays zero. So very interesting thing is that you might expect that, okay, uh, you would just pay a little bit more if you're behind, but you also need to take into account this probability. You need to figure out the probability you're going to get played in the next round, condition on the history, and then react to that. Otherwise, the principal can do these funny things where you know, he picks arm one for a while to you know, incentivize the other arms into thinking that arm one is defective. Okay. So, Sort of the core lemma that uses this uh, low regret property of the algorithm is this thing which says that there's no way for the low regret algorithm to force this sort of algorithm to defect while maintaining low regret. So in particular, if both arms are using this strategy, then with high probability, they'll never defect. Okay. So what's the idea behind this proof? So the idea is that, all right, so you want to show that the difference, the only defect when the difference in the number of times arm one and arm two played grows above B. So you want to show that this thing stays bounded by B for all time. So the idea is to relate this directly to the regret. So whenever this difference increases, the regret also increases, the regret sustained by the algorithm. So let's let R1 of T be the total regret due to not playing arm one. So arm1's value up to time t minus uh, the arms you've chosen up to time t. And let's define r2 similarly. And so by definition, since we're using strong Lorgan algorithms, r1t and r2t are less than delta for all times t with high probability. All right, so when do you accumulate regret? When do r1t and r2t change? So there's uh, two cases. So you can only re accumulate regret when the two arms would have paid you different amounts. And that only happens when one of the arms is going to pay you delta and the other arm is going to pay you zero. So one of the times when the arm is going to pay you delta is when this condition happens. So when it's more likely 
that arm one get played, and arm one has already get, gotten played more often than arm two. So in this case, the arms offer, so arm two offers theta, arm one offers zero. And uh, there's two things that can happen depending on what the algorithm does. With probability P1T, either he picks arm one and regret two, like a regret two increases by theta, or probability one minus that, he picks arm two and arm one's regret decreases by theta. Is that correct? I might have swapped that. Something like that's true. All right, yeah. And if you look at the expected sum of his regrets, the expected sum of the regret at time t plus one given the sum of the regrets at time t is this expression, which is at least the sum of the regrets at time t. So in particular, the, oh well, there's also a second case. So the second case is like analogous, just everything swapped and this inequality still holds. So in both cases, the expected sum of regrets conditioned on the past sum of regrets increases. So this thing forms a sub -marnico. And regular by Azuma's inequality, we know that the probability that the sum of these two regrets drops too low is bounded. So you'll never have some case where basically uh, you'll have very low negative regret for both arm one and very low negative regret for arm two. And this is important because now it lets us bound R1T and R2T over all times two. All right, so what about uh, the quantity CI? We need to eventually show that it's unlikely that C1T minus C2T grows larger than P. So we can also look at what happens to C1T and C2T in this situation. So, um, yeah, so let's bound the probability that C1T minus C2T ever grows larger than P. So let's look at the last time D equals zero. Let's let tau equal that time. And let's let delta S be the uh, plus minus one difference between these two quantities at times S and S minus one. So it's easy to see by some telescoping that uh, C1t minus C2t is at most the sum of delta s from tau plus one to t. And we can break this into two cases, uh, rounds where it's more likely to pick arm one than arm two, and rounds where it's more likely to pick arm two than arm one. Okay, so let's focus on the first term. So, um, This quantity delta S is one whenever arm one is chosen at time S, and it's negative one whenever arm one is, uh, arm two is chosen at time S. And also we know that because we chose tau to be the last time uh, that C1S equals C2S, and we're trying to bound the probability that C1S is at most B plus C2S. Something like that, C2S minus B. Uh, we know that this thing is greater than zero. So in particular, if we have all these constraints, if you chose arm one and arm one is played more than arm two and the probability of picking arm one is bigger than the probability of picking arm two, then your regret increases by theta. Um, and also, if uh, basically, if C1S is bigger than C2S, then it follows that C2S plus one is at least, what's this? Okay, I think you just need this fact. Uh, in any case, from, from this fact and this, you can see that this sum is at most the difference in regrets divided by theta which is, at most, since the regrets are bounded in this interval, uh, 
negative to root t log t to delta to positive delta. And you get you get some bound on this uh, for some. All right, then we can also similarly bound the second sum even easier because when the probability of picking arm one is less than the probability of picking arm two, the expected uh, value of this delta s is just p1s minus p2s and it's the most of zero. So basically, this sum can't grow too large. And basically, by Huffing's, with high probability, it's the most true root t log t. And you can sum up the different parts. And with high probability, c1t minus c2t is the most 6 root t log t, which is what we chose p2. And it's a little of t. All right, right. So, a question. Sure. <clears throat> The, so the definition of the P's conditioning. Mm -hmm. So the P's are in the strategy, the arm strategies, right? So presumably they're measurable with respect to the let's see, yeah, so, observations so, of which arms got. So the important thing to note is that we're doing this analysis in the case that both arms are following strategy S star. So if they're following S star, then, okay, so it's tacit, which is confusing, because it means you don't know what the other person reported. But if you assume that he's following S star, you can figure out what he reported based on uh, the history up to that point and whether he's been played more than other. He's either going to report zero or theta, and you can figure that out. Okay, so assuming they both play a star, then the- Then everything uh, makes sense. Then everything makes sense. So the P's that are conditioned on the sequence of the reports and pulls or whatever that, but that, that sigma algebra ends up being the same as the one. As the one that like, where you could observe everything, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, a subtle, it's a subtle point because this is like the tacit model, so the arms can't see anything. So you might suspect that maybe they can't compute these PIs, but uh, luckily, because of like, we're forcing them to use the strategy S star, they can't. All right, so uh, let's recap what we've done so far. So this is the equilibrium strategy. Basically, if you're even pulled less and you're less likely to get pulled than the other guy, you should give epsilon, otherwise you should give zero. And we showed that if the guys, if the both arms use this strategy, with high probability, uh, they won't trigger this defect condition. All right, so the next question is, why is this an approximate dash equal? Uh, one more question. So presumably actual strategy, um, like there has to be some kind of uh, slack in that defect condition, because like, you would never, uh, you never actually pass your entire value. But even though you get pulled all the time, that would give you zero uh, utility. Um, so definitely, so I think this is going back to whether this is a sub perfect Nash or not. So definitely if the guys, if they're both playing this, it's still a like epsilon approximate Nash equilibrium just because this won't happen with, uh, yeah, okay. probably. And then, so we'll talk about this in a second, but if someone purposely causes a defect, mm -hmm. they can't get much more, they'll probably get much less than if they uh, just follow S star. Basically, to argue that this is an approximate Nash equilibrium, we need to argue that if arm two is following S star, then arm one can't deviate to some strategy S and get like more than little o of t. Mm -hmm. And yeah, in fact, that's what we'll do. So yeah, so assume with a loss of generality that Q1 is bigger than Q2. And we have this constraint before that Q1 minus Q2 is in most Q1 origin. This will be important in showing that this is actually an equilibrium. So if both arms follow S star, you have this sort of even market share, and both arms get played half the time. So arm one gets Q1 over two per round, and we get total utility of this guy. Q1 over two times T minus the of T. Right. But if arm one deviates and plays some other strategy instead of S star, 
with arm two still playing S star. So there's sort of two conditions. Uh, this should be made more formal, but the actual math isn't that interesting, so I'll hand wave it a bit. So if the defect hasn't been triggered, arm one is played in most P more times than arm two. So it gains in most Q1 times B, where B was about root T delta. Delta is like root T, so it, this is little o of T. And on the other end, if the defect has been triggered, then basically in order for arm one to get played at all, arm one must play at least Q2 on average to pay more than arm two. And because arm two is paying Q2 per round. And in this case, arm two will get at most, I mean, arm one will get at most Q1 minus Q2 per round. And as long as this gap between the two means the most uh, the amount they get in the market share strategy, uh, this ends up being an equilibrium, or an epsilon approximate equilibrium. And yeah, arm one can't get more than little of t by dv. Okay, so for two arms, I won't go through the proof for k arms, but I'll just show you the uh, equilibrium strategy, because it's a little bit different. It turns out like the most straightforward generalization of that doesn't work. But it, it, it's similar, and the proof is kind of similar. So uh, we have k arms. You set your b and theta similarly. And you, again, compute the probability that the principal will pill you conditioned on what's happened so far. And now you give, instead of just giving 0 or theta, we'll give some fractional amounts. We'll give theta times 1 minus the probability you'll get pulled. And some of this is very nice. This will give exactly a even Marcus put every arm will get pulled one over k over the time. And the proof is similar to the two arm case, except you have to work with these fractional models. Oh, so this time you ignore the C's? Um, yeah, this time you actually completely ignore the C's. This just works. OK, so the counterpart to this which is simpler is that if we don't restrict ourselves to lower grid algorithms, then the tacit case, the principle can get non trivial revenue, is theta of t. And um, yeah, so the setting is there's k arms, arm i is drawn from some distribution with mean ui. And the main idea is just run some sort of second price auction, ask the arms to report their own means, right, like giving you that amount per turn for a while, and then compensate them via some scoring rule. Um, and once you've done that, you play the arm with the highest mean as long as it gives you something as big as the second largest mean. It gives you lower, stop playing that arm forever, do something else for the rest of the time, or you can play other arms. Um, so more formally, I'll write it out so you can see exactly what it looks like. So there's this constant u, it's just a lower bound on the minimum log of the UIs. So you start by playing every arm once, assume all the arms are strategic, and let xi be the value that arm i reports. Then you compute uh, the second largest. So i star is the arm with the largest xi, the largest reported value. And well, they actually give you the money, so the largest amount they gave you. And x prime is the second highest mean, or second highest reported value. And then what happens is you communicate to I star somehow the value of uh, the second highest, oops, this should be an X prime, the high, second highest mean. And then you play the best arm for some number of turns, like the vast majority of the protocol. And you always ask I star to give you at least X prime. If arm, if it ever puts something smaller than this or different from it, just stop playing it. And then, so you have to recompensate the arms for telling you the truth in part one, because the lower value arms have no incentive to pay you money if uh, they're not going to get chosen for round three. So you're just going to play each arm some number of times for free. And the number of times you play it will be roughly log of their value. And this ends up being a scoring rule, so it's in their incentive to actually report exactly what they think they're doing. Um, and I won't 
go through the analysis because it's not too interesting. And I think intuitively it's sort of clear what's going on. But uh, basically all the non-best terms will report the true mean in the beginning because they're rewarded at the end of the, the scoring rule. Since we run the second price auction, the best arm also is incentivized to be truthful. And if u prime is the second largest mean, then the principal end up making u prime times t plus the low of t revenue. All right, so there's a couple of questions you can ask. So there, there's something sort of fishy about this algorithm that we didn't really do any learning. We just asked the arms for things they already knew. and they told us and then we just chose the best one and that sort of knocked the point of multi arm bandit. So natural question is, what if the arms don't know their means? No one knows exactly what the means are. Um, it turns out you can do something similar, which also doesn't really bypass, like doesn't solve this problem if you're not actually doing learning. But so what you can do is you can play each of the arms for free for some amount of time at the beginning, a little of few time. And then the arms themselves can learn their mean. So some sub constant precision. And then the principal will still make roughly the second highest mean times t revenue. But now the mechanism is only approximately truthful. And we'll get some bound in the of at least to the two thirds. And yeah, you're basically still offloading the learning to the arms. Um, the other extension, which you mentioned earlier, is what if there's some non strategic arms? So that's another question you might ask, because non strategic arms aren't good at participating in this auction. But it turns out you can fix the previous protocol so that even non strategic arms participate. Basically, instead of asking every arm to report their mean, like the first rounds, you actually just divide, divide all the rounds into blocks of size t to the two thirds. And now we'll just use the average value in these blocks as what they report. So even though there might be a really high variance for a non-strategic arm over like one specific round, if you average it over a block, uh, it'll be very close to its average with that probability. Not very, but close enough to still get something in the form maximum of the, the largest mean of the non-strategic arms and the second largest mean of the strategic arms. All right, so I'll just mention some future directions we're working on. And yeah, so one thing related to what I just mentioned is one question we're trying to solve is, is there some actual like natural mm. mechanism that actually learns over time instead of just asking for all the information at the beginning and sell, basically selling the business to the best form. And yeah, and another way to phrase this is the algorithms I just mentioned completely fail in settings where the distribution evolves over time. And you might want you know, something that can learn the distribution as it changes. Um, so yeah, our auction mechanism doesn't actually do any learning. It offloads all the learning to the arms. Um, and there's some interesting settings where maybe you can think about whether it's possible to, to do something interesting. So one setting is like Markovian bandits where there's some hidden state and the distribution depends on that state. For example, one setting could be your mean drifts over time. So it starts somewhere and every round either increases a little bit or decreases a little bit. And you can still do some auction and you'll get some non-trivial revenue uh, at the beginning. The question is, can you do anything better than just auctioning off the entire business right at the beginning? Um, Another thing that's uh, been bugging us is, so we, we phrase the theorem in terms of, you know, there's some instance where collusion can occur, but actually we think collusion can probably occur for every choice of distributions for the arms values. You know, we shouldn't need this uh, constraint on the gap of the largest two arms means. And yes, yeah, so it currently works as long as the gap between the top two means is small enough, but Somehow, our current proofs just failed for the case where. Right, so, so they failed for a very reasonable reason, which is that if you try to run the same proof and give like a uniform market share to everyone, then if arm one is way better than arm two, it's actually an arm one's interest to just like, uh, ignore all the other arms and just play the second highest arm. 
That's about it. So one way to fix this is instead of giving a uniform market share to every arm, you can sort of try to partition it to a different market share where maybe you want one arm to receive, get played 60% of the time and some other arm to get played 40% of the time. And the question is, is this possible in general? Can we, for any like partition of the market, is there some sort of collusive strategy in the tacit case that would partition it arbitrarily between the arms? Uh, and, and our proof somehow only works to partition it uniformly. Um, it's hard to get something which isn't uniform from the general k-arm proof. But for the two-arm case, we do know that it's possible to get like, arbitrary partitions. For the two-arm case, any uh, choice of distributions for the arms, there is some sort of collusive, like collusive strategy. Okay, and uh, another question is, is there anything meaningful we can say about strategic bandits with adversarial rewards? So it's not super clear what this means because it's not really clear how to define equilibrium in this case because the arms need to do something which will maximize their overall expected utility, what they think their expected utility will be at the end. But if the rewards are adversarially chosen, this doesn't make sense. So you can also ask questions like, what if the arms themselves are playing lower grade strategies? You could, you could sure ask if the rewards are chosen at time zero, a given adversarial reward to each arm, or I mean the history of rewards from time one to t. And then they can best respond to that knowledge. Yeah, so that's another thing you can do. You can, you can basically. But then, tell what, the, what are the adversary like? Like, what is adversary like? Like this non-adaptive adversary. In time zero, a nature adversarially gives something to every single person, mm -hmm. like a history or a reward from time one to t will be like this list. And you want the theorem statement to say for any such list you give? Any such list you give. And then it's a check equilibrium just by the lists. Uh -huh. And then there's a question, does they know each other's list or not? Okay. And then this. So there, there was something we're thinking about along these lines where, yeah, everyone knows everyone's lists or whatever, or sort of, but your strategy can only depend on, like at time t, you can only depend on the part of the list you've seen so far. And to ask if there's any sort of like truthful or dominant strategies in this case, I think. As we found was yeah there can't be anything like the answer yeah it's very um and then it's more in general can we apply any of these sorts of methods to other situations so this sort of showed like a negative result that you can't do uh good like learning by using a lower grade algorithm maybe you could like, put this uh, collusive result into this collusive strategy into like a positive result and use it to exploit uh Algorithms which are running lower grade strategies. So maybe there's other dynamic bandits or auction problems where these methods can apply. And also, maybe in some of these settings, we can avoid this really strong behavior of collusion. All right, so that's it. Uh, thanks for coming.